Okay, I saw, to my dismay, a post on Piazza last night, time 7.22 p.m. ish, 7.22 and 47 seconds or something like that, that I'm in 306 Hollister and there's no TA for office hours. Anyone, anyone want to claim that post, claim credit for that post? Okay. Uh, I'm just curious, did, any, did a TA eventually show up to that office hour? Does anyone know? Does anyone even know? I don't think they did. You don't think they did? Okay. Well, I've been in touch with the TAs, uh, or at least a communique went out to the TAs. I haven't heard anything back. So I'm not sure to what to attribute such radio silence from the TAs. What do you think, Alex? You're a TA. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Myself. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so. But and one of the TAs, like last week, said, uh, um, "Okay, we need to get organized. Who's doing what office?" And I didn't hear. You know, so I'm really not sure what's going on there. Uh, I, you know, probably poke the TAs with a stick and see if they're <laughs> <laughs> still around. But anyway, I just want to apologize for that that lack of TA. That's not going to happen. We're going to staff those office hours. We have plenty of people in our group our cast of thousands running this course to do that. So I apologize for the absence of the TA last night. Okay. So anyway, we were talking about sampling <laughs> pure sinusoids. And first I went through an example from life about the movies. We'll get back to that. Okay, but at the end of the last time we were talking about sampling your sinusoids. So what's the starting point for that? The starting point for that is you have a signal x of t equals a cosine 2 pi f0 t plus phi with all the usual stuff. a is positive, f0 is positive, phi is in minus pi to pi. And you have some sampling interval t sub s given. And f sub s is 1 over t sub s. These are respectively the intersample interval and the sampling frequency. And you form a signal x of n by taking samples of this x of t every integer multiple of this. So continuous time signal. Sampling interval, sampling frequency, discrete time signal. We saw that given F0 and Fs, there are infinitely many continuous time pure sinusoids that sample the same as x of t. And we call those continuous time aliases of x of t with respect to the sampling interval t sub s or sampling frequency f sub s. So terminology, we noted that for every k bigger than 0 integer, the signal, say, q of t equals a cosine 2 pi frequency f0 plus k f s t plus phi, quote unquote, t sub s samples the same. as x of t. That is to say, q of nts equals x of nts equals x of brackets n for all n. And we call these continuous time aliases of x of t with respect to, so call these q of t's or q's of t. So just say q of t signals continuous time aliases of x of t with respect to the sampling frequency f sub s. Or you could say with respect to the intersample interval t sub s, if you want. That's fine, because f sub s and t sub s are related. And I talked about why they're called aliases. 
But anyway, from this, you can see that there are continuous time aliases of x of t with respect to fs of arbitrarily high frequency. It turns out that in most cases, in almost all cases, there is a unique <laughs> continuous time alias of x of t of smallest frequency. And at the end of class last time, we were talking about figuring that out. And today, what I want to do is finish that discussion, then give you a formula or formulas for all the continuous time aliases of x of t with respect to fr sampling frequency f sub s, and then get into this really important result called the sampling theorem. And there's lots of roots to the, to the answers here. And we're just going to take one. But anyway, OK, it turns out, provided provided that f sub 0, the frequency of x of t, f 0, is not a half integer multiple of f s, that is to say, f 0 is not equal to f s over 2 or 3 f s over 2 or 5fs over 2, et cetera. That's what I mean by half integer multiples of f sub s. There's a continuous time alias of x of t of smallest frequency. So there's a unique continuous time alias of lowest frequency. Okay, And we call this the principal continuous time alias of x of t with respect to f sub s. How do you find it? You find it as follows. And we might as well give this a name, say x sub prin of t. So you find it as follows. Find x prin of t as follows. You draw frequency space. You don't have to draw this. You can just do this all in your head if you want. So here's 0, OK? Here's fs over 2, and here's minus fs over 2. And out here someplace is going to be, say, f0. So the original signal x of t has frequency f0. We sample it at frequency fs. What do we do? We take f0, and we step it down by integer multiples of fs. So you step f0 down by integer multiples of f sub s. So there's 1, 2, and then 3, something like that. And you will land in the interval in the f interval, minus fs over 2 up to fs over 2, open interval, not including fs over 2 and minus fs over 2. Why does it not include those? Because there's no way to step an f0 down and land on this or on this when f sub s is not an integer multiple, or f sub 0 is not a half integer multiple of f sub s. All right, when you land in that interval, you may possibly, and we'll see what well, we're going to do a couple of examples of this in a second, so you'll see how to build these with real examples. Uh, sometimes you're going to land to the right of 0. Sometimes you're going to land to the left of 0. And you have two different little sub recipes to apply in those two different cases. So two things can happen. I should say one of two things can happen. 
one of two things can happen. You land in the interval 0 up to fs over 2. Okay. If you land in that interval, you call the landing frequency f prin. So this is the frequency at which you land. And x prin of t is going to be a cos 2 pi f prin t plus phi. The other thing that can happen is you land in the left-hand side of that interval. So you land in the interval between minus fs over 2 and 0, not including 0. In this case, you let f prin equal to minus the frequency where you land and x prin of t, the principal continuous time alias of x of t with respect to f sub s is going to be a cos 2 pi f prin t minus phi. There's going to be a change in the sign of the phase. So this is the difference here when you land to the left of 0. And the book derives all these things. It's very easy to do. But let's do an example. Let's do, let's do an example where we have a, a single f sub s, or single x of t, and we sample it at different f sub s's and find out what the principal continuous time alias of the x of t signal with respect to those fs's is. So let's look at an example. Suppose x of t equals, how about uh, 7 cosine 2 pi times 11 t plus pi over 13, something like that. That's a perfectly good x of t. Okay. Let's sample it at three different f sub s's and see what happens. See what the principal continuous time alias of x of t with respect to those f sub s's is. So I want to sample at some different sampling frequency f sub s and find the principal continuous time alias in each case. And because, of course, because principal aliases are with respect to a sampling frequency, you're going you're gonna to find different ones for each case. All right. So how about let's sample it first at, um, say, 17 hertz? How about that? So how about first f sub s equals 17? What do we do to figure out x print of t? We draw our frequency space, like so. Here's 0. Here's fs over 2. That's going to be 17 halves and minus 17 halves. So this is fs over 2. And what is x? What is x's frequency? It's out here 11. So this is about 8 and a half. So this is a little more than that. OK, so that's there. This is 11. So we step 11 down by integer multiples of f sub s until we land in the interval minus fs over 2 to fs over 2. And you only have to do one step in this case. So you land here at minus 6. So you step down from 11 to minus 6, thus. We're in the second instance over there, the instance where you land in the interval minus fs over 2 to 0. f prin is equal to 6. And x prin of t 
is equal to 7 cosine 2 pi times 6t minus pi over 13. Sign change in the phase occurs because you're in the second instance where you land to the left of 0. And you can plug in n, ts, and you will see that x of t and x print of t sample the same. OK, so how about another sampling frequency? How about you sample it at, say, 5 hertz? So fs equals 5. What do we do to figure out x print? We draw an f. Here's 0. Here's fs over 2. So it's 5 halves minus 5 halves. Okay. And 5 halves is about 2 and a half, so 11 is out here someplace, right? So I step this down by integer multiples of fs. So it's going to be this, and then this, and boom, where do I land? I land at 1. Two steps down. Now we're in the first instance, where you land to the right of 0 and x print of t. So we step down 11 to 6 to 1. Thus, f prim equals 1 hertz, and x prim of t, principal continuous time alias of x of t with respect to f sub s, equals 5 hertz, is 7 cosine of 2 pi times 1 t plus pi over 13. No change in sign in phase required. And finally, how about? Um, how about fs equals, say, 23? How about that? It's a, that's a fine frequency. What do we do? We draw our f space, like so. Here's 0. Here's 23 halves and minus 23 halves. Those are our fs over 2s. And where's 11 now? 11 is r just inside there, right? So in this case, we don't have to do any stepping down. We're already in minus fs over 2 to fs over 2. We start there. So in this case, no step down required. In other words, f prim is the frequency of x itself, and x prim of t is equal to x of t. Now, why this example here? This example shows that it's possible. Yeah, you have a question. No, no, I'm going to give you, I'm going to tell you what all the how to find all the continuous time aliases of a given sinusoid in a second. Remember, you have ones of arbitrarily high frequency. You have ones way out, even over here. I don't want to leave the room, but the point is you're always going to have a unique one of lowest frequency. And that's what we call the x print with respect to, OK. The point of this last example is, so the upshot here is that x of t can be its own principal continuous time alias with respect to f sub s. When does that happen? When does that happen? That happens when no step down is necessary, which is the same as saying
that's the same as saying that fs is, or sorry, f0 is less than fs over 2. Or, if you will, fs is bigger than 2 f0. So there's this sacred condition relating frequency of x of t with sampling frequency that tells you when x of t is its own principal continuous time alias. What does it mean to say x of t is its own principal continuous time alias with respect to s of s? It's that in this case, x of t itself is, quote unquote, the lowest frequency sinusoid that fs samples the same as x of t. x print of t is always the thing in quotes. So note the thing in quotes, that's essentially the definition of x print of t. But in this case, when f0 is less than half the sampling frequency, or when the sampling frequency is bigger than twice f0, x of t itself is x print of t. OK. All right, so this is the recipe uh, for finding the principal continuous time alias. How do you find arbitrary aliases of x of t to sort of relate to your question? Okay, just this is something I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to ask you to do in general, but how do you find, so here's a side note. Can we compute all continuous time aliases of x of t <laughs> equals a cosine 2 pi f 0 t plus phi with respect to f sub s. And of course, like <clears throat> asking it in this way as a rhetorical question, I wouldn't do that unless the answer were yes. Therefore, the answer is yes. Of course. Of course we can. OK, so how do you do that? How do we do that? All right, so how? OK. Well, you can, you, first of all, you, it depends on whether you're in the first instance thing where you land in f0 to fs over 2 or the second instance thing. And assume throughout that f0 is not a half integer multiple of fs. So that computation we just talked about works. And this, remember, I call this the pesky boundary case. It's going to come back to haunt us in several different versions as the semester goes on. And at the very end of the semester, I'll, toward the end of the semester, I'll give you a handout that explains all those. But anyway, OK, so first off, you start with f0, OK? And you step it out by integer multiples of f sub s. And you get a bunch of aliases of the form x of t equals a cosine 2 pi f0 plus k f s t plus phi. And that's for all k bigger than 0. Okay. Then you step it down. by integer multiples of f sub s. And for each stepping down, you're going to get a continuous time alias of x of t. 
So you get aliases of form x of t equals a cosine 2 pi f 0 minus k f s t, this is an f s, plus v for all k's until this thing goes negative. So for all k bigger than 0, such that f0 minus kfs is bigger than or equal to 0. There's going to be some first k value for which the thing in there, f0 minus kfs, is negative. So for some first k value, we'll have f0 minus kfs is less than 0. Once you hit that value, you do the following. You take the signal q of t, which is equal to a cosine 2 pi f 0. Let's call this k k hat, just for the heck of it. So f 0 minus k hat f s t plus phi. And you turn it into a cosine 2 pi k hat f s minus f 0 t minus phi. Why can you do that? Because cosine of a negative theta is the same as cosine of theta. You just negate both the whole argument of the cosine. And then you take this one. This is going to be a continuous time alias with respect to f sub s. And you take its frequency and step it out all the way. So take this q of t and step it out, step its frequency by fs multiples. And that will give you all the rest. all the rest of the continuous time aliases of x of t with respect to f sub s. So let me just run through, let me apply it to one of our examples that we did earlier, where we, we sampled an 11 hertz cosine at frequency, say, 5 hertz. And the only reason I'm doing this is because it exhibits a sort of cool symmetry about where all the frequencies of the continuous time aliases sit in frequency space. So let's revisit x of t equals, say, 7 cosine of 2 pi 11 t plus pi over 13. Sample that fs equals 5. Okay. All right, so let's draw a frequency space like so. Here's 0. And here's 5 halves, minus 5 halves, and so on. And we had 11, so 11 is going to be, this is 5, 10, 11. It's going to be like here. Okay, so what is fs? fs is 5. OK, so this is 2fs is 10, and 3fs is 15, and minus fs is minus 5, and so on, and so on, and so on. All righty, so, and this is 0. Let's make 0's hash mark a little bigger. All right, so we can construct continuous time aliases at all these frequencies that are 5 above, 10 above, 20 above, or 15 above, and so on. So you have one here at frequency 16. 
you have a next one up, so this is 20, say 20, have one at frequency 21, and so on. These are the ones you get by stepping 11 up by multiples of f sub s. Now you step 11 down by multiples of f sub s. You get one at 6, you get one at 1 hertz, so to speak, right? And then you step that down by 5, and ooh, where do you go? You go to minus 4. Oh, so minus 4. You have you land, that's the first time you land negative. So what do you do now? You take that Q of t, which is going to be a cosine 2 pi minus 4t plus pi over 13, and you flip the frequency, flip the phase, and you get one at frequency 4. So 4, you're going to have one here. And then you take that one and you step it all the way out. You get one at 9, you get one at 14, and so on. So what I've labeled on this picture, OK, have labeled on this picture the, the hash marks with labels above. So strategically, I put labels of frequency below. The hash markers labeled above are the frequencies of all the continuous time aliases of x of t with respect to fs equals 5. And remember, this is really important to drag along the sampling frequency. The expression continuous time alias makes no sense without a sampling frequency, frequency with respect to which you're talking. Okay, the, those are the frequencies of all the continuous time aliases, and the phases of them are either plus and minus pi over 13, depending. So the phases of the ones that say 1, 6, 11, blah, 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 are pi over 13, and the phases of the ones 4, 9, 14, etc., are minus pi over 13. So you can see that what's going to happen is you're going to have these, you're going to have a pair of continuous time aliases at each of frequencies that are one apart from the multiple of s sub s. And this is a recipe for figuring out all of them. Now, you rarely have to do this. You, I, I certainly won't ever ask you to. Maybe I will, actually, come to think of it. Because I, ne I never spent the, the necessary five minutes on this, this picture before. So maybe I'll throw you a homework problem where you have to figure out all of them. But anyway, OK. Yeah? Is negative 4 count as one of them, or is it just a? Th that's just a, a thing that we use in the computation. I, I always think of these things as always going to be positive amplitude, positive <coughs> frequency, phase in minus pi to pi cosine. Now, if you did the spectra of these, you would have spectra that are symmetric. Right? We're, we're going to be doing stuff like that as we go along. But for now, I just want to think of them as cosines, positive frequency cosines. OK, great. So that's how you figure out all the continuous time aliases of x of t with respect to a given sampling frequency. And we noted that if the sampling frequency and the original frequency of x of t have this relationship, then x of t is its own principal continuous time alias. All right, so keep all that in mind. Right now, we're going to turn to, we're going to state something called uh, shannon nyquist sampling theorem. OK, now this is a, yeah, Jack. <laughs> because, because <coughs> like, there's no way you're going to get this, say, by taking the 1 at 1 and doing it out by integer multiples of 5. So, so do we use both of those and then step them out by inter integer multiples of those directions? No, we, well, we, I'm just giving you, I'm giving you a recipe. And the recipe goes like this. You know, you step it to the left by multiples of 5. And you're going to land to the left of 0 for the first time at some point. OK, when you do, you stop. And you say, OK, in this case, the Q of t is going to be you know, 7 cosine 2 pi minus 4t plus pi over 13. That's the same signal as 7 cosine 2 pi 4t minus pi over 13. So 
So when you're stepping it back, do you flip the, do you flip the as well? No, you're, you're not flipping anything while you're stepping. You're just stepping, stepping, stepping the frequency, keeping the phase the same, and then you're going to land to the left of zero some first time. And when you do that, you invert the whole argument of the cosine, which positivizes the frequency, if that's a verb, okay, and negates the phase, okay. And then you have a whole new, like, uh, source for continuous time aliases to do the stepping out process on. Okay. Got it? Yeah. All right, excellent. This is good. So, so we have this thing called the Shannon-Nyquist sampling theorem. So what is the Shannon-Nyquist sampling theorem? It's, it's it, just a little story about this. Like we, one of our old bu building manager before Patty retired some years ago, and he, he decided he would do something fun, and he polled the ECE faculty. What do you think the most important thing ECEs have ever done is? Okay. Now, there's a lot of candidates for that, like transistors, you know, integrated circuits, um, VLSI, computers even. I mean, we could take credit for those, right? But the one that won the election was the sampling theorem. So a theorem beat out transistors. Isn't that weird? And so what does that say? It either says our faculty our members are unduly theoretical or mathematical or something, but, but this is a hugely important result, okay? All right, so it's attributed to Shannon and Nyquist. So this is the next thing I want to talk about is this Shannon. And some people call it, this is my name for it. Okay, some people call it just the sampling theorem with no names attached. Some people call it Shannon's sampling theorem or the Shannon sampling theorem without Nyquist. Some people call it Nyquist's sampling theorem, okay, without Shannon. And I don't know why they do these things, but they do. I call it Shannon Nyquist sampling theorem, you know, give full credit where credit is due. Who are these guys? Shannon was more or less a mathematician. Nyquist was more or less an EE. And they were working around the same time at Bell Labs, which is the world's greatest industrial laboratory. Okay, or was. Okay, now I looked up your your name is Alec, right? Okay, I I wanted to make sure that I didn't have to call you like Homedo guy, and I didn't have to call you Cedar Knowles guy. So you're Eric, right? Okay, I couldn't find Bergen County guy on the pictures. So what's your name? Bogan. Say it again. Bogan. Okay, that's a hard one. <laughs> I'm not looking up. <laughs> All right, all right, so Hermogenes. All right, so, so anyway, um, Bell Labs was the world's greatest industrial laboratory, and it had several installations. It, it was kind of a New Jersey thing, which is a point of pride for me. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the most mathematical Bell Labs place was at, a, at Murray Hill, New Jersey, okay? And my mom's father worked there at the same time as these guys. My dad worked at Whippany, which is more, did more defense type work, okay, which is near where you grew up. And I worked one summer at Homedell, which is where he grew up, <laughs> okay. But anyway, uh, Bell Labs, great place. Now, what happened to Bell Labs? Why, why isn't it around anymore, essentially? It, I mean, it is kind of a shell of its former self is around, but why isn't Bell Labs around anymore? Well, there was a court case in the mid-80s, I think 1984 was when it was finally decided, that broke up what was called the Bell System. Now, the Bell System was AT&T plus something called Western Electric, which is a manufacturing arm of AT&T. They made phones, like dial phones and stuff, and touch tone phones and all that. And also things like uh, New Jersey Bell, New York Bell, all these, the, the, the state phone companies, so to speak. These were all under one umbrella. And then there was Bell Labs, which was the R&D part of it. Now, the thing about R&D is it costs money, so you, need, you have to fund it. How do they fund it? Well, basically, they gouged everybody on long-distance phone rates, essentially. So AT&T charged these outlandish fees to make long-distance phone calls. And there were certain hours of the day where it was more expensive. Like, you know, if you, 
If you wait until after 7 p.m. on a weekday or Saturday, then the rates go down. But if on Sunday the rates are low all day until 7 p.m. and then they go up because everyone's calling their mom on Sunday night, you know, it was crazy. And it was like 13 cents a minute. It, you know, it's no comparison to what it costs you guys to make phone calls today. But all that money from the people went to fund this awesome research. <laughs> but companies like MCI, Sprint, you know, those kind of things, they said, hey, th this is unfair. We could do this much cheaper. You're gouging the, you should, this is a monopoly. You should break it up. So they broke it up and there was no more funds for Bell Labs. Okay. And that's what happened. But anyway, Shannon and Icarus were there in the, you know, flush with money era. And Shannon is the father of information theory, which is a branch of, you know, applied math and EE. And and that's the sort of the basis of all digital communications and stuff. You know, things like the entropy, how much information is in a message, how many bits do you need to code messages of a certain complexity, blah, 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 blah. And he published this one paper that essentially does all of information theory, and he published it in 1949. And everything that people do nowadays in information theory is based on that one paper. Like, they, they say, well, Shannon posed this problem and everything. And the reason he could do that, get it right the first time, was that the, all the work he did during the war, World War II, was, was classified. So he wasn't allowed to publish anything for like 10 years while he was working it all out. All right. So he could get it right the first time. Now, nowadays, you can't do that anymore. You know, if you're, if you're working on something, you're going to get, you're not going to get tenure unless you put out half-baked papers while you're working out the details, right? And then finally get it right at the end. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but whatever. Okay, so these guys came up with, independently and together, this sampling theorem. And, and to what kind of signals does it apply? It applies to signals much more general than the, the kinds of signals we've been talking about so far. And it, so it applies, this applies to signals much more general than just sinusoids and sums thereof. But we're only going to really be able to understand it in the context of those signals, at least for now. Suffice it to say that for a wide class of signals, a wide class of continuous time signals, there's a way to define frequency content of these signals. OK, so it turns out that for a wide class of signals, x of t, we can make sense of the concepts, quote unquote, frequency content of x of t. Now, when we're talking about sinusoids and sums of sinusoids, it's pretty obvious what we mean by frequency content. It's just the frequencies of the terms in the expression for x of t. But it turns out for a wide variety of signals x of t that aren't sinusoids, you can make sense of this. Con and the tool for this is the Fourier transform, the continuous time Fourier transform. And that's a really complicated thing, but it's, it's not that hard to understand. But it really takes you far afield when you're doing a course like this. And so I don't do any continuous time Fourier transforms in this class. The book doesn't do any continuous time Fourier transforms. Professor Dorschuk's version of this course did, does, whatever, use, do continuous time Fourier transforms. But I leave it out for now. So it makes sense of that concept. And also, it makes sense of the concept of what's called a band-limited signal. So band-limitedness. What does that mean? It means, essentially, that all the frequency content is in a bounded range of frequencies. OK. We say that x of t is band limited when all of its frequency content And that's, like I say, something you're going to have to take my word for it. We can make sense of lies in a bounded range of frequencies.
say, 0 up to, say, f max. So let's call f max the smallest upper bound you could put on all the frequency content. Or no, let's, let's do this, closed interval. So we call f max, in this case, the bandwidth of x of t. Now, bandwidth, that's a word that gets misused a lot. You know, it's one of those sciencey words that people like to throw around, you know, to sound cool. You know, you could be watching like some, you know, Ellen DeGeneres show where people are getting dunked into these, you know, things. And she might say something like, oh, what'd you say? I don't have the bandwidth for that. You know, I mean, she, she doesn't, she's not really talking about bandwidth, but she's using the word to sound cool. So you find this all the time. You know, you can, you can find hotelies on Hope Plaza talking about not having the bandwidth for their food and bev class this semester. So they're going to drop it, you know. But anyway, <laughs> when all the frequencies, so what, what, is, what, what do these concepts mean in ter in, when x of t is a sum of sinusoids? So note, when x of t is just a sum of sinusoids, the, the frequency content is just going to be the list of frequencies of the individual terms. I know we're a little late for the three minute break, but we're going to do that after I write this list of frequencies of the individual terms. And bandwidth f max is just the frequency of the highest frequency term. So for example, if you have a Fourier series with infinitely many terms, that signal is not band limited. OK. So anyway, let's take the three minute break. And given these concepts and the fact that we can do it for a broad range of signals, state the sampling theorem and see how it applies in the examples we've talked about so far. OK, so anyway. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> so anyway, um, you have this concept of frequency content of a signal. And we know what it means when you have a sum of sinusoids. And the concept of what it means for a signal to be band limited and what its bandwidth is. And we know what that means for a linear combo of sinusoids. But this theorem applies to signals more general than that using these more general concepts. So how does the theorem go? I'm going to state it in a really rough way. The book states it in this rough way. But this is, the way, this is a way that, that is not hard to explain to your relatives, I've discovered, over time. And it goes like this. So Shannon Nyquist sampling theorem. Oh, and by the way, I gave, I gave Shannon credit for information theory. Might as well, t t Nyquist did a lot of stuff in control systems. You know, you might have heard of the Nyquist criterion for stability of a feedback system. I don't know. It, the Mechie person might know that. But anyway, the Shannon Nyquist sampling theorem says the following that if x of t is band limited with bandwidth. F max, OK, and F sub s is strictly bigger than 2 F max, which is the same thing as saying F max is strictly less than F s over 2. And ooh, you're going, ooh, we've seen this before somewhere. If there's that relationship between sampling frequency and max frequency in amp, then you can, in principle, and this is in principle, LE, not AL. AL was for principle alias. This is in principle 
meaning that you know, in the best of all possible worlds, you could do this. You can, in principle, reconstruct all of x of t exactly from the sequence of samples of x of t taken at frequency fs. So the fs sample version of x of t, which is just x of n is equal to x parentheses of n t s. And ts is equal to 1 over fs here. And that's the rough statement of the shannon nyquist sampling theorem. And it's truly an astounding thing because x of t, so this is maybe surprising because x of t constitutes a continuum of values. And what we're doing is we're somehow reconstructing a whole continuum of values just from taking that continuum of values and sampling it every now and then. OK, and x of n is just a, a discretium. I don't know if the, what the discrete version of continuum would be. So that's just a discrete set of values. And you know, when I first saw this when I was in school, I, I think it was senior year in college, um, I, was, I thought, wow, that's really cool. But you know, how could you possibly recover continuum of values from a discrete set? But, but th this happens all the time. Like if you have the Fourier series coefficients of a periodic signal, that's a discrete set of numbers. And you can build the whole signal out of that. You know? So yeah, as, I, I mean, yeah, I got older. I got more jaded about the math. You know? Sure, there's lots of cases where there's a discrete set of values. But this, this, this is kind of surprising because graphically speaking, you have this complicated signal x of t. You just pluck a bunch of points in it. And somehow you know how to fill in that graph just from those points, along with the knowledge that x of t is band limited the appropriate way. Anyway, the, the statement of the theorem that works in colloquial settings is, quote, if you sample a band limited x of t fast enough, you don't lose any info about x of t. By virtue of the sampling process. So that's another way of thinking of it. All right, so, so that's the shannon nyquist sampling theorem. And it's a remarkable result. And the book talks about, you know, how it comes up in daily life. We've already mentioned it before, like music has max frequency, say 20 kilohertz, and CDs, the CD standard starts with a 44.1 kilohertz sampling, which is a little more than twice the bandwidth of the music. OK, so we've seen these kinds of F max, FS relationships before, just to remind you. So we've seen, seen the quote unquote f max less than fs over 2 type thing before. So music has f max on the order of 20 kilohertz, and fs cd sampling rate, sampling frequency. FS is 44.1 kilohertz, so it's bigger than roughly equal to 2 F max for the music. That's an example of where we've seen it before. All right. So anyway, let's look at a special case. Suppose you have an X of T, so a special case that's just a cosine. X of t is a pure sinusoid. X of t equals a cosine 2 pi f0t plus v. 
Okay, before we do that, I want to give you a, a way of thinking about this. And the book says something along the following lines. It says, note that we're not describing how you do this reconstruction. It's just something you can do in principle. All right. Fair enough. So note, the theorem in and of itself is silent on how to do the reconstruction of x of t given a Nyquist fast enough sampling. Okay. That's an expression meaning that you sample bigger than twice the bandwidth. The way I like to think of it is, is as follows. That if you take your x of t that's band limited, and by the way, um, some spell checkers object to me making band limited one word without a space. Okay, And depending on what you read, band limited might be one word. That's the way I do it. Or it could be two words. Or it could be a word, two words with a hyphen in between them. Okay, All of those are equally valid. They're you know, different ways of writing the same thing. None of them is better than the other. Band limited, f max bandwidth. If you take that and you pass it through an ideal c to d, with sampling frequency fs bigger than 2f max, and you get an x of n out of that, that's a discrete time signal, that there's some kind of magic box right, that you can put this x of n through, and out will come x of t. So. So think of it as there's a way, we're not going to tell you how, of taking a sampled fast enough version of x of t and reproducing x of t. And we call it a magic box. Later on in the semester, we'll talk about exactly what's in the magic box. Does anyone know? It's, a, it's certainly a, it's a certain kind of interpolator. It's, it's what you could call an ideal t sub s interpolator. That's what the book does, or an ideal c to d with interpolation interval c t sub s. So the, the magic box we'll discuss later what's inside the magic box. But for now, what we're going to call it, think of it as, and the books says this, book terminology, an ideal C to D to C with interpolation interval T sub S, which is 1 over FS. All right. So anyway, let's look at an example. So here's an example, special example. Suppose x is just a pure sinusoid. x t of some frequency f0 and some phase phi, some amplitude a. OK. So. What if, what if you sample it at some fs that's bigger than twice f0? So x of n is going to be x of n ts, where ts is 1 over fs. Then what you've got going on here is you've got x of t going into this ideal c to d with sampling frequency fs. 
and x of t is band limited, and f max is what? Just a reality check. I'm letting you guys tell me. If x of t is a pure sinusoid of frequency f0, what is f max of x? Yes. Yes, exactly. It is the frequency of the cosine. Correct. And he knows that not just because he's from near the Bell Labs orbit in New Jersey. OK, so x of n comes out. And you put it through the magic box. What's going to come out of that? x of t, because you sampled the signal faster than twice its bandwidth. OK, but now suppose, hmm, suppose we take this x of t and we sample it at a frequency, f sub s, that doesn't satisfy that all-important inequality, f sub s bigger than twice the bandwidth. Certainly, you know, the magic box is just a box. We can put anything into it we want, right? Any discrete time signal in the world can go into that magic box, and something's going to come out. What if we take some f sub s that is not bigger than twice the bandwidth, and we have that same x of t, same x of t going into the system, and it's band limited. And f max, again, as usual, it's just f0, goes into the ideal, c to d. And now we have fs, which is not bigger than twice f0. You get an x of n out of that. And now we put it in to the magic box, the ideal d to c with interpolation interval ts equals 1 over fs. What's going to come out of there is some signal, y of t. Because you don't have the necessary relationship between sampling frequency and bandwidth to have the sampling theorem apply, y of t is not necessarily going to be x of t. So note, because f sub s is not bigger than 2f0, we can't apply the theorem. We can't apply the theorem to this situation. We don't know what y of t is a priori. But what is it? Can anyone, anyone, ha anyone care to hazard a guess of if I take x of t, a pure cosine, I sample it at a frequency that's not fast enough, and I put it through an ideal C to D interpolator, what do you D to C interpolator, what do you think comes out? Yeah. Say the whole thing. <laughs> Yes, that he had the answer, except I had to, <laughs> I had to finish it. OK, what, what is y of t? y of t, in this case, turns out to be the principal continuous time alias of x of t with respect to f sub s. Why is that the case? Let's see. So it turns out, and oh, as always, I'm assuming that we're not in the pesky boundary case where f0 is, in, is a half integer multiple of s of s. Turns out y of t in this picture equals x prin of t, the principal, principal. So here, here the in principle 
LE reconstruction leads to the principal continuous time alias of x of t with respect to f sub s. All right. Why is that the case? It's very simple to prove that with pictures. OK, so here's a proof by pictures. First, we just replicate that picture. So we have x of t goes into c to d with fs. Out comes x of n, ideal d to c, ds. Out comes y of t. OK? Now, here's another picture. We have the same two box compound system there. And instead, we drive it with x print of t. So the same c to d with fs as your sampling frequency. Then you get some signal here, and you put that into the same d to c with interpolation interval ts, and you get something out. And we're going to figure out what we get, what, what each of the signal arrows is. All right. What is x print of t? x print of t, this is a pure cosine of frequency f print. Now, what does f print satisfy? How do we figure out f print? We took f0 and we stepped it down until we landed in the interval minus fs over 2 to fs over 2. By construction, this means that 0 is less than or equal to f prin is less than fs over 2 by definition of f prin. Okay? So what does this mean? This means that x print of t is band limited with bandwidth f max. And f max is equal to f print. And f max is less than fs over 2. So what happens when we put x print through the system is we get x print of t out. And in here, we have x print of nts. Now, how do we know this is by the sampling theorem? Because what we've done here is we have taken a band-limited signal and sample it faster than twice its bandwidth and put it through an ideal interpolator. Voila, we get the signal back by the sampling theorem. Why does this x print of t equal this y of t? That's the question. Why does what we get when we put x of t through that whole mess equal what we get when we put x print of t through the whole mess? So compare the two pictures. So compare the two pictures. Why, or why, is y of t equal to x print of t? OK, so let, let me see if you guys can answer that one. You take those two pictures. Both of those are valid. We have no clue what y of t is yet. 
The second picture, because Shannon is right, why does y of t in the first picture have to equal x prime of t in the second picture? In one case, in the first picture, I'm driving the magic box with x of n. In the second picture, I'm driving the magic box with x prime of nts. That's another discrete. Yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. His point is the following. This x of n is the same as this guy. If I called this a q of n. Q is my favorite like miscellaneous throwaway letter for a signal. You know, I don't know why. Because q of n equals x of n. Why? I.e., x prin of nts is the same as x of nts. And this is because x prin is a continuous time alias of x of t with respect to that frequency. And that's what it means to be a continuous time alias. It samples the same. Because x prin of t is a continuous time alias, it's a special one, of x of t with respect to fs. And that just means that they sample the same. OK, so the bottom line is, the bottom line is that when you take an arbitrary cosine and sample it at an arbitrary frequency, not counting pesky boundary case, and you put it through an ideal interpolator, what comes out of that ideal interpolator is its principal continuous time alias with respect to that sampling frequency. And that's a really important result. And this extends to sums of sinusoids. So it extends in the natural way, linearly, so to speak, to x of t equals a finite sum of sinusoids pure signs, pure sinusoids with maximum frequency f max. In other words, <clears throat> if you sample such a sum bigger than twice f max and put it through the system, then out comes the original x. If you don't necessarily, what you're going to get is the sum of all the principal continuous time aliases of the individual terms. We'll, we'll wrap up that detail next time. And then we'll go back to the movie example and make sure we really understand that. I have some graded homework here, by the way.